ding 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 this is how they do it in um in hollywood it's just a piece of it's not cgi it's just paper and sellotape that's that's all you need we talk about this one today get it we talk about this james bond seamaster it's so close to being perfect Welcome back to Bark and Jack. I am Adrian. This channel is just about drinking coffee, talking watches, and that's exactly what we're doing. I'm quite new to the new Omega family. I've had many vintage Omegas in my time. Recently, I bought myself the White Dial Seamast, and I absolutely love this watch. But when I was shopping for this watch, this No Time to Die James Bond Seamaster was very much in the running until I saw the price of it, and I just really couldn't justify the, the massive price difference. The white dial is 4,450. This titanium no date version is 7,880 pounds on the bracelet. That is a huge price difference, but there's a lot of subtle differences which takes this one to the next level. The James Bond version, although I hate the fact it's connected to James Bond, but we're just gonna call it a James Bond Seamaster. That watch is, I feel so much more of a refined product. It just feels like it's got more character and I hate that I've got these side by side because there's a lot that I like about the James Bond. They've got the same movement, but this one just has the no date version. It has a domed sapphire crystal. We have a loomed bezel. And then the biggest difference is the fact that the case is made out of grade two titanium. We also have a Milanese bracelet and this bracelet is both superb and uh, silly at the same time. Again, another small difference, but quite an important difference is the broad arrow symbol, which is on the dial and on the case back. This symbol marks British government property. You'll see this on old military watches, like my CWC G10 that I have here. It kind of looks like an arrow pointing to the crown. That is the broad arrow symbol, and that's only on the government property. So it's a bit weird that Omega has this on a watch which isn't government property and was never issued to the British military. Omega did have to get special permission from the British government to use the broad arrow symbol. Although it's a completely pointless symbol on this watch because it is meaningless in this instance and it is a fake symbol because it's, it's not what it's intended to be, it does look cool. I like it. Just like the Fotina. I kind of feel like the Fotina on this watch, which I know is a contentious thing. A lot of people dislike the Fotina, but I feel like in this situation, it works very well because titanium is a dark metal. Also, the bezel is brown. The bezel isn't black. It's a very, very dark brown. And so it kind of, this caramel looking loom and markers, it all just works very well. The movement is what kind of sold me on my Seamaster. It's a phenomenal movement and that's, I've, I've gone on loads about it. Um, but it's a shame that we can't see it in this one because it's exactly the same movement. It's just the no date version. Uh, and it's a shame that we don't have a display case back on this watch. The things that I love about this watch are the fact that we have a dome crystal. It adds a nice amount of character to it. It has that kind of feeling of Hesalite to it, uh, which is, is brilliant. It just adds character to the watch. The bezel, I absolutely love that the bezel is loomed. And I was really annoyed to find out that this bezel, my white Seamaster bezel, wasn't loomed. The loom on a James Bond Seamaster is just brilliant. Love that. I also really like the look of this bracelet. The bracelet looks incredible. It feels incredible. I like the fact that it has the gaps between the case and the bracelet itself. Again, a little nod of vintage, but this bracelet is amazing. It feels amazing. It feels really substantial, not like a lot of Milanese bracelets, which are kind of just feel a bit flimsy. Uh, this really is very nice. And then you have these pressed in holes, which again, it's all machined incredibly. The bit that I love the most though, is the tip. The tip is actually stamped Omega on the end. And I think that is really very, very cool. It's just such a cool attention to detail and it tapers, nicely tapers. Um, but the, the thing that I absolutely hate about the bracelets, uh, again, it's it's a shame because it was so close. Even this little mechanism to, to feed the, the bracelet into the deployment clasp is brilliant. There's so much I love about this bracelet, but the massive flaw in this bracelet is the deployment clasp itself. Just the size of it is huge. So with this watch, it's not your lug to lug measurement, which you need to think about to figure out whether this watch is wearable for you or not. It's a width 
of this bloody deployant clasp under here. You've got the deployant clasp and then the way the Milanese bracelet kind of wraps around or kind of just, so this is the size of the watch, obviously. And then this is the size of the deployant clasp. Well, this section actually here is the deployant clasp. And then this part is how the bracelet bends outside of the clasp. It just means that you have a chunk of metal which isn't flexible in the slightest. This is solid. And that section there is far larger than my wrist. I have small wrists. My wrists are 17 and a half centimeters. So I have relatively small wrists, but Again, this bracelet just doesn't work. It feels silly and it looks silly just because it doesn't bend around your wrist. The connection to James Bond is such a gimmick. If this was connected to the SAS or something or something genuine, something real, then it would still be a gimmick, but it would kind of be an understandable gimmick like the Speedmaster and going to space. They milk the shit out of that but it's kind of understandable. It'd be silly if they didn't because that is cool. But James Bond is a fictional character. It's like them making a watch for Harry Potter. That's how ridiculous it is. So it does ruin this a little bit for me with the fact that it has James Bond on the back. I'm sure it's a big money maker for them. I'm sure having that James Bond franchise and them being able to have James Bond on a train being asked if his watch is Rolex. Amiga. That is a huge product placement opportunity. Beautiful. I'm just glad that they stopped doing the bloody 007 on the counterbalance for the second hand. This is a pricey watch. And uh, for me and my once in a watch, I, I can't justify the price increase or the price difference rather. Uh, but titanium is a more expensive metal to work with than steel. No doubt there is a James Bond tax added to this. So I can understand why this is more expensive. It's just for, I mean, I, I would actually quite like this. It is nice. If you've got larger wrists, then most certainly get this on a bracelet because it looks incredible. It's one of the nicest bracelets I've felt. Otherwise, if you've got tiny wrists, then get this on a NATO strap. The Omega NATO straps are really very, very good. This watch isn't mine. This has been lent to me by Edible Watch Company again, but I, I don't want to damage the watch. Uh, so rather than plugging our NATO straps, I'm going to plug the watch roll that we've just launched over at Bark and Jack. Dot shop. Handmade in Florence, Italy. We have calfskin leather and super soft suede to keep your watches nice and safe. And it fits up to six watches. Or you can just make some sort of travel case out of it by having straps, watches, and your tools in there. These are live over at barkandjack.shop with free worldwide shipping. That's enough shilling now. So back to the watch. Typically, Omega has made quite drastic changes to the Seamaster range over the years. It's had a long lifespan, but they've changed dial colors, dial texture, the hands, the bezel, the bracelet. The overall design is iconic, but I don't feel like there's a timeless version of the Seamaster, unlike the Speedmaster Professional or the Rolex Submariner. The Rolex Submariner and the Speedmaster, they are truly timeless designs. And I actually feel like this Bond Seamaster is the closest that Omega has got to creating a timeless Seamaster. Therefore, I feel like this is the closest Omega has got to creating a Seamaster that truly rivals the Rolex Submariner. I would love to see Omega carry on going down this path. I'd love to see them take features from this Seamaster and implement them into the normal stainless steel offering. I'd get that stainless steel case and from the Bond Seamaster, I'd take that double domed sapphire crystal. I'd take that flat dial, remove the broad arrow, remove the Fotina. I'd also take that awesome matte black ceramic loomed bezel and then I'd remove the helium escape valve. This I think is a winning timeless Seamaster. Of course, this is all just subjective. These are just my thoughts, but I'd love to see Omega launch that. I've got a couple of questions. One, what do you guys think about the Seamaster? Two, what do you think about the James Bond thing? And three, what do you think they're gonna do next? Omega aren't scared to do really quite drastic changes to the Seamaster range. So I won't be surprised if they did take a lot of this forward. I would definitely get a 42 millimeter no date Seamaster. Guys, let me know your thoughts. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you like the style of this video, hit the subscribe button down there and little bell icon so you get notifications when I drop a new video. If you're interested in straps, accessories, jump over to barkandjack.shop. If you're on Clubhouse, give me a follow. I love that app. I think it's brilliant. Give me a follow at Barker or join the club. The club is B and J Coffee and Watches. Just search Bark and Jack and it will come up. If you're on Instagram, give me a follow at Bark and Jack. And I'll see you guys next time. Take care.